Hello, I am Professor Gilbert Bernhardt, your instructor for physical geology. I am so glad you decided to take this course. I think you will find the course very interesting. After all, it is about the planet we live on and often take for granted. My goal is for you to learn as much as possible about this planet and the processes that form it and rejuvenate it. On most of the slides, you will see a speaker icon. When you click on the icon, you will hear my discussion concerning the slide. I think the best order is to read the slide and then listen to the discussion. Remember that to truly understand the material, it is very important that you read the textbook and complete the labs. I will assign study questions from the end of each chapter. You will answer the questions and turn them in for a grade. At the end of each unit, Every three or four chapters, you will be given a major exam to be taken at the testing center. The tempo of the course is designed for a chapter or at most two per week. If you do not keep up, you will have difficulty passing the course. Science is not easy. However, like your other courses, by reading the text, reading the slides, listening to my lectures, and answering the questions, you will succeed. Geology is an observational science. For example, the picture you are looking at is an example of a branch of geology called geomorphology, the study of landforms. This picture was taken on the Altiplano in Bolivia and is called the Rocas de Dali, and the particular rock formation is named Arbol de Piedra, or stone tree. We not only see the land forms, we, but we also try to see and understand the forces that shape our planet. The Altiplano is a windswept desert, and the rock formation you see is a remnant of a layer of sedimentary rock that has been shaped to the form you see by wind erosion. These rocks are very strange and bizarre, and were named after the surrealist painter Salvador Dali a very strange and bizarre artist who loved this part of the world. What else is strange or different about this image? Obviously the moon. What time of day is it? Is the moon rising or setting? Why do we know that it is a daytime and around noon? Look at the shadows. Of course, we don't all see the world the same. Go to the next slide. This is what I saw when I began to paint this tribute to Dolly. Two dog heads on an elephant leg and a hand escaping the desert floor. Now this was all done in fun, but sketching a landscape helps us think about the landscape, how it is formed, the evolution or order of events that created what we see. Go to the next slide. Here is another shot that involves the sun and the moon. Where are we? How do we know? Is it summer or winter? Why is the water so calm? We are in the Arctic Circle. How do we know this? Ice and water and no landforms. Probably very near the North Pole. How do we know this? The low sun on the horizon and it is beneath the moon. The moon is waxing crescent and the crescent is located in the very southern hemisphere of the moon. If we were at the equator, the light reflected would begin at the top, go along the right side, and end at the very bottom. So there are many things we can understand about the Earth by using our eyes. Observation and testing are the cornerstone of science. Go to the next slide. Why study Earth? Because the Earth interacts with us every day. We especially notice it when it interacts with us in big ways like earthquakes, volcanoes, landslides, and floods. When the earth moves, it can shake the surface of the earth, causing massive destruction, toppling buildings and destroying our utility infrastructure. Electric lines get broken and the start, sparks start fires that cannot be put out because the water lines are damaged. There's no water to put them out. Volcanoes erupt spewing lava and pyroclastic material onto the earth, creating new land and landscapes, and often destroying cities in the process. 
Earthquakes can cause landslides that can destroy roads and cities when thousands of tons of materials slide down mountains. Some areas along rivers have tremendous floods every few years that spill into our cities and, and onto farmland that causes billions of dollars of damage yearly. Go to the next slide. Resources. All the resources we consume are products or gifts from the earth. Petroleum to run our cars and for plastics. Natural gas for cooking to warm us and to produce electricity. Coal, again to warm us, to smelt ores for steel and to produce electricity. The same for uranium. Although all of these resources are vital for our everyday life, is the use of these resources healthy for the planet and the life forms on its surface? So we will be speaking about the ethics of using these resources during the semester. For example, is mount mountaintop removal really necessary to extract coal? Where does the spoil, that is the rock and soil above the ore, go? What does this do to the streams, to wildlife, and to the coastline marshes? What about the contaminated byproducts given off by nuclear fission? Where do we put it? The Earth is unique in our solar system. I think it is fair to assume it is the prettiest planet, and perhaps in, the, in our solar system and perhaps in the universe. We are at just the right distance from the sun to have a livable atmosphere, to have the metals we use, to have water, to be temperate, and to create food for all living things. We owe our lives to this planet, and you should be, at the very least, interested to know how it works, to be able to answer your children's questions regarding this planet. At the least, when they ask you, what is, the, what is this rock? Why are there mountains? And why does the desert have all these strange shapes that look like elephant legs and dog heads? You will be equipped to answer them. Many of Earth's processes are active and we have to exist in relation to those processes. For example, what is unusual about this image? Why is the city in the background? Yet man continues to build and live on parts of the earth that are very dangerous. Why do we do this? Since we do, what can we do or how can we build to lessen these dangers? Knowledge gained from the study of geology can aid us in where to build. A very simple example is, should you build or we build in a floodplain? Why should you not? What can we do about those who do? Next slide, please. As we have said before, the earth and its materials or resources we use every day. It houses us, it protects us, it sustains us, and we also love the little bits of minerals or gemstones that adorn us. The rocks you see in this image is kimberlite and the gem is diamond, both a clear one and a yellow one. The processes that form diamonds are unique. They form within the Earth's upper mantle, about 100 kilometers deep, under extreme heat and pressure from carbon. How do we find these and other precious gems? How do they get there and how do they form? Again, questions we will find out this semester. Perhaps the second most important resource we have on this planet is soil. Soil is formed from the erosion or breakdown of the bedrock or country rock. It is a small rind on the, first, on the face of the earth. Soil thickness over the continents average from one to two meters thick. The earth is 6,400,000 meters thick, and the soil layer is a meter thick, a very small fraction. It is the resource that allows life or living organisms to prevail. Soil forms from the breakdown of bedrock or parent rock, most of which is formed in situ. The soil contains much of the minerals locked up in the rock. All living things consume either directly or indirectly the minerals that plants absorb from the soil. You are composed of those minerals rearranged in your body 
like your bones or your blood and, and need the addition of new minerals to sustain your body. What isn't consumed is reintroduced to the soil by plant decay. Good farming techniques protect the soil and poor techniques cause erosion and unsustainability. All the water in our solar system is either derived from the processes that formed our planet or from processes that formed the solar system. We need water for consumption, for energy, to grow our food, and for recreation. Humans enjoy the earth so much that they want to be a part of the landscape, swimming, floating, caving, camping, or like this woman hanging from a rock outcrop. Landforms are derived from differing earth processes, from the collision of continents to form mountains to great valleys carved in the earth by stream erosion or deserts formed from wind erosion. Unique ecosystems have developed on these varying landscapes. Landscapes certainly have aesthetic value to humans painting and sculpting. Our largest monuments are carved from its mountains. And the number one reason why we should study Earth, we all live on it. Geology is divided into two classic major divisions, historical geology and physical geology. Historical geology is the study of the physical, chemical, and biological processes used to interpret Earth's past development, such as mountain building, climate change, and the evolution of organisms as preserved in fossils. The word geology is derived from two Greek words, geo meaning earth and logi meaning study. So the definition of physical geology is a scientific study of the origin, history, and structure of earth, including its composition, features, and physical processes, as well as humanity's interaction with it. Geology as a science did not begin until the late 17th century. It began with the onset of the Industrial Revolution. Gentlemen farmers, landowners in England, were employed by the railroad industry to describe the terrain and the rocks they own, so that they could build the new rail lines quicker. From that humble beginning, physical geology as a science was initiated and developed into, into the following realms geochemistry, geophysics, paleontology, planetary geology, geomorphology, mineralogy, petrology, stratigraphy, structural geology, hydro hydrogeology and hydrology, resource and energy geology, and environmental geology. Geology is one of those is geology is one of these sciences that involve all other branches of physical science. One might say that geologists are well-grounded in science. Geologists study the Earth from its coldest regions to its warmest regions and from outer space to the center of our planet. It is a science that we saw on the previous slide that in incorporates all scientific disciplines. As this slide illustrates, Earth processes are events that occur over time. They can be as slow as one millimeter per 1,000 years for sediment accumulation in deep seas to as rapid as several kilometers a second when the ground breaks during earthquakes. We will talk a lot about plate tectonics or motion of lithospheric plates this semester. These crustal plates move over the mantle at a speed equivalent to fingernail growth from about one centimeter a year to a maximum of about nine centimeters per year. This is very rapid in the world of geology. The North American plate moves about one inch per year to the Northwest. Pay attention to the figures in your text. Many exam questions are derived from them. Geology is the study of the rocks from the inner core to the soil layer on the crust and the processes that form them and distribute them throughout the planet. It involves erosional processes that sculpt the surface of the planet, its geomorphology. 
It is a multidiscipline science that involves all the other hard sciences. As geologists, we strive to understand these processes, these systems that make up the history of this planet, and it is a very old planet. The latest radiometric dating of meteors suggests that the Earth is about 4.56 billion years old. One way we know that the Earth is layered is through seismology or the study of wave motion through the Earth. When the Earth shifts or moves or, or creates faults, waves are produced that pass through the Earth at varying speeds dependent on the density of the rock it passes through. The details for this will be covered in this course. The Earth is divided into five layers. The first is the crust on the surface having a thickness ranging from about seven, uh, five to 70 kilometers at its thinnest and thickest. The crust is underlain by the upper mantle having a thickness of about 400 kilometers and a lower mantle that is about 2,500 kilometers. The outer core, which is molten, underlies the lower mantle and is about 2,255 kilometers thick. At the very center of the planet, we have a solid nickel iron core that is 1,215 kilometers thick. So the radius of the Earth averages about 6,500 kilometers. Because the crust of the Earth is solid and the Earth flexes often due to tidal forces, the crust is broken into large plates. These plates are found in the lithosphere, which is comprised of the crust and the upper portion of the upper mantle. The lithosphere is floating on top of a denser plastic mantle that is slowly convecting or moving at a speed comparable to your fingernail growth. The asthenosphere zone lies below the lithosphere and above an even denser lower mantle. So to recap, why study geology? The simple answer is because we can. It is hard for me to understand how a person could not be totally fascinated or at least be curious about this place we live on. What is this rock we are standing on? How did the Grand Canyon form? We developed this huge brain to think with and part of that thinking is curiosity. This curiosity is the fundamental basis of the scientific process. As we as we are beginning to understand, geology touches almost every aspect of our life. Why the very bones of our bodies are formed from the minerals that are released from the breakdown of the rocks around us. These minerals are consumed by every living thing on the planet. We ingest both organic and inorganic minerals, and these minerals are what build and sustain our body. I think we owe the earth a great kindness. We owe our existence to these resources, to the climate, to the environment, and by being aware of, all, of the natural hazards that surround us. Why is data alone not science? What do we have to do in order to understand our data and utilize our data to make good decisions? Is there a methodology developed that will help us understand that data? The answer is yes, there is. Go to the next slide. This is a basic flowchart attempting to explain the scientific method. You can see that there are steps or procedures scientists utilize to successfully answer the basic questions. The scientific method is a very thorough, time-consuming, and rigorous methodology to find repeatable answers. Not all experiments end in success but they all start with someone being curious and asking questions. I do not expect you to memorize this flowchart. However, the next slide points out the basic steps of the scientific method, which I expect you to know. Ask questions. Again, the curiosity. For example, how does water, a liquid, erode rock, a solid in streams? Collect information. Go to the library and collect all the information you can about stream erosion. Review the data. Read the information. Try to duplicate the experiments that others have done. See what the differences are. State the problem. After, after you review, you will have a clearer understanding that most stream erosion is by physical erosion caused by the saltation of rocks along stream bottoms. 
but that doesn't explain what occurs in unconsolidated streams that don't transport gravel. So the question may be, how does physical erosion occur in unconsolidated streams? Formulate the hypothesis, a statement. Stream erosion in unconsolidated streams beds occur as a result of the sheer stress water exerts on the channel bottom. Test the hypothesis. Distribute sensors in unconsolidated streams in your area recording water height, water temperature, water velocity, and the square area of the channel to see if the forces in the stream are enough to overcome the resistance of the clays in the channel. Then do that in many streams under differing environmental conditions. If the tests refute the hypothesis, then modify or make new hypotheses from the results and retest. If the tests, lastly, when all the results have been analyzed, they have to be presented to the scientific community at large. This is usually accomplished by writing up your work and presenting it in a journal, such as the Journal of Hydrology, to be reviewed and retested by your peers. If it is approved, then you have added your theory to the large body of information on stream erosion. So you can see that theories are not come by easily they are not opinions, but provable ideas that have undergone rigorous testing by you and your peers. One of the problems with the scientific method is that sometimes the experiment will outlast the experimenter because of the time element lasting from centuries to millions of years. Consequently, one can't set up field experiments to wait to see how long it takes for limestone to, to erode or deform. Also in stream studies, if the stream is not flowing during the summer, your instrumentation will not work. So a lot of geologic experiments occur in the lab. For example, in nature, it takes millennium to contort and deform rock, but we can achieve the same results in the labs by compressing rocks under varying temperatures and pressures and achieve a string of data points that help us predict outcome. Also, mathematical modeling help us understanding understand how large-scale events occur. You can't slam two planets together to see if they will create a moon, but by modeling, we can apply varying forces or differing parameters and see how they affect the results. You need to know the difference between principles or laws and theories. Kepler stated in the first law of planetary motion that planets orbit the sun along elliptical path. But the, that doesn't tell us why they do. This is a principle because it does not offer an explanation. A theory, on the other hand, is an explanation of why things work. A theory is rig rigorously scrutinized and tested conceptually and not a tentative explanation of opinion. For example, the theory describing gravity forces between objects offers an explanation for Kepler's law of planetary motion. So to recap, the scientific method integrates inquiry, explanation, and testability in understanding natural phenomena. Geologists use laboratory studies more often than some scientists do to the rates of, and scales of some Earth processes. Principles or laws are generalizations about the observation of nature, whereas theories offer accepted and well-tested explanations for observed natural systems. Two of geology's pioneers, James Hutton and Charles Lyell, conceived of and refined the concept or principle of uniformitarianism, one of the longest words in geology which states that processes occurring today most likely occurred in the past under similar environmental conditions. Now this is an amazing law because this principle gave geologists the tools needed to understand both current and ancient processes on earth. For example, it, is, it essentially means that erosional processes today, how mountains erode, are essentially the same as the processes that eroded mountains in the past. Go to the next slide. Here is another practical explanation of uniformitarianism. 
If we observed ripple marks being formed on today's beaches, we can assume that when we find similar ripple marks frozen or preserved in sandstone, that they were also created in a similar beach environment millions of years ago. This is a wonderful tool that allows us to observe the geologic processes going on today and can help us interpret the processes of formation that occurred in the past. Here is another example that this normal fault that we're seeing in the foreground in which the block of land to the right dropped down in relation to the block of land on the left is similar to the many events that caused the mountains in the background to be formed. Some of the caveats to uniformitarianism are that early conditions, for example, temperature and chemistry, in some instances differed from the same processes today. For example, iron that was precipitated from the ocean when the earth had a much lower oxygen content less than 17%, more than 2 billion years ago, differs from iron precipitated less than 2 billion years ago when oxygen became more dominant. The older iron deposits are gray, and the younger iron deposits that were oxidized during deposition are red. Plate tectonics one of the newest theories in geology was finalized in the 1960s. This theory states that the Earth is composed of 15 major plates of varying size and that over time these plates have moved, growing together and then breaking apart over the millennia. Most of the major Earth processes are associated with this amazing theory and we will be visiting and revisiting this theory many times during the semester. The 15 major plates are divided into two basic groups, plates that are mainly oceanic crust and plates that contain both continental and oceanic crust. Some are quite huge, like the European and North American plates, and some are quite small, like the Juan de Fuca plate off of Northern California, Oregon, and Washington. Other differences are that the crust of the marine plates are heavier and more dense than the plates containing continental masses. We will, talking, we will be talking about the theory of plate tectonics extensively during this semester because the theory explains so many of the processes that have in the past and do affect the Earth today. Because of the high frequency of earthquakes and volcanism around the Pacific Plate, it is known as the Ring of Fire, where the areas are pointing oppositely are the divergent zones or ocean ridges, where the areas point towards one another, they are convergent zones, and the yellow lines represent transformed boundaries where the plates slide past one another. In the oceanic regions, most of the plates separate and go into opposing directions due to upwelling convecting mantle material. These are divergent boundaries. Where the material upwells, it forms new crust on the two separating plates, making them wider. The separating plates create a series of opposing normal faults or ridges. These ridges are known as mid-oceanic or oceanic ridges. They are areas of volcanism and often forming volcanic islands. The material is denser because the material is derived from the mantle and they move due to the convecting mantle material pushing the plates in opposing directions. The plates come together at convergent boundaries where the oceanic plate is subducted or dives under the other continental and or oceanic plate. Where the plates dive under, it sinks into the mantle. The convergent zones are an area of many deep and shallow earthquakes. When the converging plates reach about 100 kilometers deep, the plate dehydrates and the rising superheated steam melts some of the rocks in the asthenosphere above the descending plate. This molten material rises because it is less dense than the surrounding material 
forming enormous volcanoes on the surface, like the Andes Mountains of South America and the Cascades in Oregon and Washington. Also, where the plates are down warping, they form enormous oceanic trenches like the Marianas Trench in the southeastern Pacific. The area where the two adjacent plates abut one another but are moving in opposite directions are called transform boundaries. These are shearing zones or vertical faults that extend through the lithosphere. An example is the San Andreas Fault Zone in California. They are very active earthquake zones with little to no volcanism. Across the earth are areas known as hot spots. They are fixed locations that have a continuously rising mantle plume from the lower mantle. The Hawaiian Islands, Yellowstone, and Iceland are examples of hot spots. As the plate moves over the hot spot, they build a new island from the almost continuous eruptions. As the plate continues to move, the islands move off the hot spot and become extinct volcanoes. The older volcanic island starts to erode and a new island forms in its vacated space. Over time, they form a chain of islands that show the direction of plate movement. These islands can be quite huge. The Hawaiian Islands and its volcano, Mauna Loa, is the highest mountain in the world if you consider the part of the island mountain that is under the ocean. Its total height from seafloor to the top of the island is 1,000 meters higher than Mount Everest. Mount Everest, as you know, is the highest mountain in the world above sea level. 